broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel, Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. great to have you with us as together we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. This broadcast is reaching across the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. If you would like to partner with us to take the whole book to the whole world, please consider making a donation. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab your Bible and let's dig in. I know that many of you give when you're at church. Uh, please continue to give to the church even while you might be unable to attend. Being a small church, that's a very small amount, but it's necessary to afford rent, uh, utilities, to be able to broadcast as we do. You can give online at calvarybirmingham.com. When you're there, just click on give. You all know that we've never passed a plate. Uh, I don't talk about giving to the church except you know, when it comes up uh, in the text of the Bible. Most other churches put a, a lot of effort into making money so they can support a large staff. Uh, their pastors write books, they hold conferences, they make movies, they push their congregations to give more and more with promises of God showing favor to those who give. We have only talked about money when it comes into the text of the Bible, when it works with the text that we are in. I don't push books, I, I don't come up with conferences, and I don't make promises of God multiplying gifts back to the giver. People who are guilted into it or who are made to think that their giving somehow commends them to God, that is people who are manipulated, do tend to give more. But we don't do that. So we don't have a large amount of savings that we can draw from and in these extraordinary times I find myself in the position of desperately needing to ask. I don't ask you to give sacrificially unless the Lord moves you to do that. I just ask that you consider giving so that we can continue. Without being here uh, at the church there are several ways you can give. Uh, you can give by mail, either set up automatic contributions through your bank or, or a bill pay service, or you can mail it directly here. Our address is Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Birmingham, Alabama, 35124. Checks can be made out to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Or you can give online. Go to calvarybirmingham.com. In the menu at the top of the page, click on Giving, and it will take you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or you can commit to a scheduled gift. Please, my friend, please pray about giving into this ministry so that we can continue to faithfully teach God's Word as we have always done. So we are in Revelation chapter 9. Picking up where we left off. From last week, uh, we weren't able to finish out the chapter. This is, a, this is a really thick chapter, a lot of stuff here. Um, so we stopped at verse 13 last week. Um, we're in the section of the tribulation that most people refer to as the trumpet judgments. Um, now, at the start of chapter of this chapter, there, there were three woes left. Uh, three trumpets remaining from chapter 8. And I'm using that word woe because that's the word that's used in the text of chapter 8, the end of chapter 8. Um, the, the angel that's flying there is saying, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. Now, remember that the seals that we saw before this, the judgments that we saw earlier, they're a big picture of what is happening during the tribulation. And the trumpet judgments and then the bowl judgments are a closer examination of these events. 
But in the way that John recorded the vision, the seventh seal leads to the sounding of the seven trumpets, in which we have the seventh trumpet being the seven bowls. So we have three series of end-time judgments from God, but they're not really what we would call separate. Uh, Each judgment is kind of a zooming in. Now, in chapters 6, 7, and 8, John, the Apostle John, who wrote this letter, saw the opening of the seals and described the terrible judgments that he saw as well as some behind-the-scenes events in heaven. And with the opening of the seventh seal, we came to the trumpet judgments then in chapter 8. Now, the first four of the uh, seven trumpet judgments were in the last seven verses of chapter 8. We saw with the first sounding, there was hail and fire mixed with blood thrown down to the earth, and a third of the trees and all the green grass was burned up. With the second trumpet, a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood, and a third of sea creatures died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. With the sounding of the third trumpet, a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, turning a third of the world's water bitter, and many people died from the water. With the fourth sounding, a a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and daylight hours were reduced by four hours, nighttime hours increased by four hours. That was the point at which the angel declared three more woes to go, and chapter 8 then ended. Now, of course, keep in mind that John did not write this letter with chapter and verse markings any more than if you were to write a letter to someone, you would add in chapter and verse markings. He didn't do that. That was added later uh, to help with referencing. Sometimes uh, those chapter divisions and and sometimes even the verse divisions fall in some unfortunate places that that break up the the pace of what's going on. Um, Here, the break between chapter 8 and chapter 9, it it actually works very well. Um, So in the first part of chapter 9, we covered the first of those three remaining woes. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and John saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. Now, we did our due diligence, and we discovered that star in the Greek, aster, um, and, and, and in Hebrew, uh, Hebrew, kovav, was often used by biblical authors to refer to divine beings. Satan is referred to as a star in the Bible. Jesus is referred to in the Bible as a star. And the angels and other divine beings are also spoken of as stars in the Bible. We knew this was more than just a star, though, in the text, because it's called a hymn. Now, this hymn is likely Satan because the text says he was fallen. Now, I won't go through all the details because, uh, well, we were really thorough last week uh, investigating these things. Um, And all that's online. It's on a YouTube channel. It's on, on our podcast if you need to go back and listen to it. Now, the keys to the bottomless pit were given to this star. The Greek words speak of a a long well shaft that leads down to an abyss, or the netherworld, the place where the most fierce, the most powerful, uh, the most disobedient of the devil's angels are held. Now, I personally believe that the star fallen from heaven to earth, again, was Satan, and and with the keys, keys which he was temporarily given, he then opens this pit. Smoke pours out of the opening, which, as we saw in our research, was a picture of God's judgment. The air was polluted, and the sun was darkened, and with it an army of demons, which were compared by John to locusts. Now, the description that John gave made it clear that these were demonic beings. They had stingers like scorpions, armor like war horses, crowns of gold on their heads, human-like faces, lion's teeth, and long hair. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree. Instead, these locusts, which have the capacity to sting like scorpions, they could only harm people, even people who are wearing green. St. Patrick's Day today, right? (laughs) Their king was the angel of the bottomless pit. His name is given 
as Abaddon, and Apollyon in Greek, Abaddon being the Hebrew, Apollyon being the Greek. Each one means destroyer. The demonic locusts were given authority to torment people night and day, and everyone is subject to that torment except those who are sealed to God. They were allowed to torment people for five months, and their sting and the torment was such that people want to die, but the text says they cannot die. This judgment, this, I should say this plague, this judgment plague, is so severe that people will prefer death over life, but death will supernaturally be withheld from them. In other words, by preventing their death, God augments the pain of those who would rather be out of it. This, this limitation, it's an increase in the judgment's intensity. But the limit of this judgment to five months also demonstrates God's mercy. However, as we saw in the seal judgments, instead of calling on the Lord, people in the severest moments of the tribulation will prefer to try to hide themselves away. It's a great illustration of how trying to find salvation in one's own works is fruitless. People have always tried to find salvation in their own works, but there is no escape from the Lord's wrath against sin except for those who are hidden away in the righteousness of Christ. And that is a a gift of God's grace that comes by believing on Jesus. Anyone and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, consider that we started with the Apostle John who was exiled on the small, rocky prison island of Patmos, which thanks to Google Earth, we can actually look at. Then we zoomed out to the seven churches of Asia Minor in chapters 2 through 4. In chapters 4 through 5, we were with John in the throne room of heaven, which Google Earth didn't have a picture of. And then with the opening of the seals in chapter 6, we're dealing with God's judgment on the whole world. And with today's study we again zoom back in and go regional to the river Euphrates, but with worldwide effects. Now, we ended with verse 12 last week, which said this, One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. As terrible as that first judgment, that first woe, the first trumpet judgment, as terrible as it was, There are two more to follow. The one passes, it's completed, but instead of relief, there's more to come. And we pick today up with the next woe, the sounding of the sixth trumpet. Now, after five months of being tortured by these swarms of demonic locusts, more supernatural beings are released. And the next round of supernatural beings destroys a third of the human beings who have survived these earlier judgments. Yet in spite of all of these supernatural judgments, we'll read this in the last few verses of this chapter. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So that's where we've been, and that's where we're going. Let's uh, go to the Lord one more time in prayer, and then we will enter into the text. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the breath that you have placed in our lungs, the, the beats of our hearts. Lord, you are the living God who is compassionate and merciful. You are slow to anger. You are abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And Lord, we ask that as we enter into this study of your written word, that you would give us wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so starting with verse 13 of chapter 9. It says, Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the, for the hour 
and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Um, Hectos Angelos, uh, angel number six, sounds the trumpet. And at the sounding of the sixth trumpet, John hears a voice that comes from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. Now, if we look at a diagram of the tabernacle, one of the first things you encounter if you were to enter into the courtyard is the brazen altar. This is where sacrifices were burned. And if you continued then to walk forward, you would encounter the uh, bronze laver, that's where, where priests could wash. Then entering the tabernacle in the holy place, you would see a lot of things. You would see table of showbread, you see the menorah, um, a lot of other items, including the golden altar of incense. And then passing through the veil and entering the Holy of Holies, you would see the Ark of the Covenant and its mercy seat. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the altar of incense would be brought into the Holy of Holies where the Kohen Gadol, the, the high priest, would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And the prayers of the people that are represented by the burning of the incense would be before the Ark. Now, of course, at the crucifixion of Jesus, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place was torn. It was rent from the top down. And so at that moment, at that time, the prayers of God's people were then before the ark. Now, all of these things were shadows of heavenly realities. And then in chapters 4 and 5, we recognize that God's throne room looked very much like this setup of the tabernacle. In chapter 8, the altar is the, scene of the, is the scene of the offering of incense with the prayers of the saints. The angel of verse 8, whom I believe is the Lord Jesus acting in his role as high priest, he's holding the golden censer, which was used to collect fire from the bronze altar, collect fire for burning incense, then on the golden altar. He's given much incense in that chapter, which he offers on the golden altar, as it says, with the prayers of all the saints. The burning of the incense in the tabernacle was symbolic of Israel's prayers ascending up to God. So we see that going on here. Only it says the incense is offered with the prayers of all the saints. These saints' prayers of chapter 8 were the prayers of the saints from the opening of the fifth seal back in chapter 6. The saints then cried out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? The first act of burning was the prayers presented before the throne. The throne is synonymous with the Ark of the Covenant. But then in chapter 8, the angel went back to the bronze altar where sacrifices signifying the sacrifice of Christ were made. He collects fire from that altar into the censer and then casts the censer down to earth. And that's when the trumpet judgments begin. And here we are at the sixth trumpet where we again see the golden altar. The Apostle John heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. Now I find it interesting that John adds the note which is before God. The golden altar which is before God. So then I began to wonder, was the voice actually coming from the midst of the horns of the altar themselves or from beyond the horns, which would be from, uh, from the, uh, the throne of God? You know, it, it would be the difference um, of saying that you heard me speaking or saying you heard a voice from the pulpit. Both would be correct because I'm speaking and I am speaking from the pulpit. The Greek word translated from here is ek. And it means from and of. And it's used in exactly that way throughout the text of the New Testament. Now, I did find something interesting in, in critical analysis of the Greek text. The New King James Version translation here has a word that's not in all manuscripts. And there is some question about whether it should be here or not. Remember that the New King James Version 
Um, it is a modern language version of the King James Version, which was translated when there were fewer manuscripts to compare and less knowledge of ancient Hebrew and Greek. And this is why if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not able to understand Greek, if you're not able to understand Hebrew, and, and you're so inclined, it's a good idea to have a few good translations to compare. Um, ESV, NASB, uh, LEB, the Lexham English Bible, and I highly recommend um, the NET Bible Online, the New English Translation. Now, we use the New King James Version because most people that I've encountered either use that version or the NIV or the King James Version, and there's, there's nothing wrong with using any of those, but I always recommend having a modern translation to compare them to. Now, in this instance, the uh, ESV, the New American Standard Bible, the New King James Ver Version, uh, the, um, the new, not the 1984 NIV, but the new, the latest version of the NIV, all use the word for. I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. But the Legs of English Bible and the 1984 version of the NIV, uh, the American Standard Version, and the Net Bible, they read, I heard one voice from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. Now, let me tell you why I like the Net Bible a lot. That's because in the online version and in the version that I have in my Bible study software, the translators give exhaustive notes for why they chose to make certain translation decisions. And in the case of verse 13 of our chapter, we see that the translators did not include the word for, and that is because, according to their own notes, several key, or that is better manuscripts, lack the word tesseron, meaning for, before keraton, meaning horns. The word seems to have been added later by scribes. Again, it's not that big of a deal. The altar of incense, like the bronze altar, had four horns, one on each corner. And so even if the word four should legitimately be there, it could be like you saying, I, I heard a voice from the four corners of the pulpit. Well, it just so happens that the pulpit has four corners and it's positioned before me and I'm speaking from the pulpit, so no real difference. I just like to investigate minutia. <laughs> Most, most teachers and commentaries will just kind of read past this and let it go, but I do think it's important that we understand the voice is not coming from somewhere between the four horns on the altar. Right? Remember what comes up from, from the, the golden altar burning in the incense. It's, a, it's, a, it's the prayers of the saints, right? which is before the throne of God. God's the one that answers prayers. So I think it's very important that we understand that it's God that is answering these prayers. The voice is coming from the throne. Even as the glory of God was between the cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant. The, the inference, again, is that this is an answer to the prayers of the saints, and this answer comes from God, not some disembodied voice among the horns of the altar of incense. God is answering the prayers of his people from his throne, which is the mercy seat. The voice then instructs six angels to release four angels who have been bound at the river Euphrates. The New King James Version says are bound. A better translation would be who have been bound. The Euphrates, it runs from Turkey through Syria and Iraq and then into the Persian Gulf. It runs south in southeast until it joins up with the Tigris in lower Babylonia. Now, its total length is somewhere between 1,600 to 1,800 miles, and it forms the boundary, um, or it used to form the boundary at one point, between uh, Israel to the northeast and, and everything that was beyond that. It, it formed a, a natural defense against Israel's enemies in that region. In fact, Scripture uses the imagery of the yearly flooding of the Euphrates to represent God's judgment using the invading forces of Assyria. Now, in the time that John was writing this letter, it wasn't Assyria, it was the Parthians who were beyond the Euphrates and were a threat to the people to the west. Now, 
it's not just the Euphrates here, but this is, this is named as the place where four angels are bound. It's interesting that the text doesn't outright say whether the four angels are wicked, but there is no other instance in Scripture of holy angels being bound. And angels is, as we would expect in the Greek, Greek it's angelos, and, and bound means exactly that, bound or tied. Uh, the root word deo speaks of things that have been tied together. So we can conclude that these four angels are wicked. And look at, at the middle of verse 15. They are designated for this time to execute judgment, but prevented from doing so until their release. The, the definite article, ho, um, the, uh, horan, our, implies definiteness. The, the Lexham English Bible, the ESV, the NASB, also uses the, the 1984 NIV uses this very hour. And this corrects a problem where the King James Version wrongly uses an hour instead. And then to go on, the King James Version then adds and a before day, month, and year. And should not be there. And, and k. Um, should only be and, not and a. These additions result in the King James Version rendering, making it appear that, that we are then to go and add together an hour, a day, a month, and a year to come up with some length, some time, some length of time, some time span. Instead, the proper rendering of the and and in other translations tells us that God in his sovereignty has ordained this particular time at which these bound or contained angels will be released as a means of his judgment. Now at the end of verse 15, we find that they were released to kill a third of mankind. But remember, this is according to God's plan. Even fallen angels cannot act outside of God's will and God's timing. They were released to kill not just to harm like before, one-third of mankind. This does not seem to be a, a, a magnification of the fourth seal since the number killed then was a quarter. So we can add a third of this chapter to the quarter of chapter 6, and that is a little over half of the world's population. And this isn't to the level of, of the Great Flood, which left only uh, a handful of people, eight out of the world's population alive, but the world is probably more highly populated now than it was in the Flood. Verse 16. Now to number the army of the horsemen was 200 million. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Um, the power of these angels to kill one-third of mankind, it seems that the, the, the means of these angels is through armies of some kind. Now, given the metaphors we had earlier with the demonic locusts, we might misread horsemen here as men like horses or horses like men. But the Greek word here is hippikos, meaning cavalry. Soldiers who fight from horseback. The, the Lexham English Bible reads this way in verse 16, the number of the troops of the cavalry. Now, like I mentioned before, the Parthian Empire, while past its prime at the time th this letter was written, was still a terrifying force. References to invading armies from across Euphrates on horseback would likely have made early readers of this letter think of the Parthians. And, you know, I don't, I don't have the best maps. There's a couple of maps up here we can show you of the, the Parthian uh, Empire, where it was and all that. And I, don't, I couldn't find the best maps, but they give you an idea of the location and the extent of the Parthian Empire as well as their influence. Now, the idea here is not that of a revived Parthian Empire, but to give readers an idea of this threatening and frightening force in a way that they can understand. Um, it's hard for us to imagine here in the United States what, what reading this might have brought to their minds, the, the people that originally were reading this letter. We don't worry about a, a great Canadian force invading from the north. 
uh, or a, a great army of soldiers uh, invading from Mexico. But what if North Korea was to our immediate north rather than Canada? Perhaps then we could understand. The Parthians could attack in, a great, in great hordes of mounted soldiers, but certainly not the numbers here. The number of horsemen in this army is absolutely astounding, 200 million. And the actual text is two ten thousand of ten thousand. Uh, duo myriades myriadon kia, which is translated 200 million. And, and like back in chapter 7, verse 4, the apostle John heard the number of them and again, they came from the east of the Euphrates. Now, during the reign of Nero, who seems to have been a type of Antichrist or an Antichrist, a precursor to the Antichrist that, that will later be, Christians were speculating that Nero could cross the Euphrates into Parthia and betray Rome and then come back as an uh, with an invading uh, Parthian force. And of course, he would be ruthless as he always was. He was a great man of lawlessness. 200 million, that is an immense army. That would be the greatest army ever seen. There is no way that the Parthians could have raised an army that large. But then John was describing end times events of the future. Now today, to the east of the Euphrates, the population is immense. But even if all the nations to the east of the Euphrates combined uh, their armies or the, the number of people that, that we believe um, could actually be in an army or could fight, that number would not come near 200 million. Unless this is something more that's being presented here. Something in addition to a human army. Now we might get a clue from the sixth bowl judgment in which we see the river Euphrates dried up to prepare the way of the kings. Three unclean spirits of demons go out and perform signs and gather kings and their armies for battle. This vast army appears to be an a amalgamation of human and demonic forces coming together. And I suspect it is the same army that we just read about, but again described later in chapter 16. Remember that these series of judgments, seal, trumpet, and bowl, unfold into one another. Now, at this point we move on to a description of the riders and their horses, but the emphasis, as we'll see, is more on the horses than particularly the riders. It's almost like they are one unit together. Verse 17. And thus I saw the horses. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth. And in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. So the Apostle John, he sets out to describe the horses rather than the riders. He, he says, thus, meaning after this manner, he saw the horses in the vision. And the first thing he must have noticed or seen then is the riders, those who sat on the horses, and John describes them as wearing breastplates. Now, we know from ancient artifacts that the Parthians had light cavalry and they had heavy cavalry. The heavy cavalry were enclosed in armor and their horses were as well. The light cavalry wore much less and lighter armor and were much more efficient. Now, remember that, that John would have been using familiar imagery to describe what he is seeing, and so he's back to using descriptive language. The horsemen are likely meant to be the evil angels that were bound before and now released, and this is why John simply says, those who sat on them. These, their, four, they, their four breastplates are an amalgam of fiery red, 
hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. These three compare to the fire, the smoke, and the sulfur that comes from the mouths of the horses, as stated in the same verse. And this indicates that the horses and the riders were either one unit or worked together as one unit. And we find in verse 18 that by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. In verse 18, the word plagues, that doesn't actually occur even in the text. Um, that's why it was, would, would be italicized if you're seeing it there in your text. It, it's legitimately added, and for our clarification, because down in verse 20, um, it's used uh, of these three. Now, fire and brimstone, sulfur, with smoke, appears several times in Scripture indicating deadly judgment. For instance, with Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, for, Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And then in verse 28 it says, Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw and behold the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And also, in, the, in prophecies of judgment, such as Ezekiel's prophecy of God's wrath against Gog in the last day's battle. It says in Ezekiel 38, And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many people who are, who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. But Ezekiel 38 is it's after the millennial reign when Satan is released and goes out to deceive the nations. Now, it's interesting that, that when these evil angels are unbound, they cross uh, from the east to attack with a demonic and demon-led army. And then after 1,000 years, we have Satan himself unbound and bringing an army from the north. Now, we've got a while until we get there. That's in chapter 20. But to let you know, Satan's rebellion is permanently crushed. Um, now, back to our text, text here in chapter 9, there is more to the description of the horses. The horses had heads of lions. The imagery of the lion's, lion's head, it, it, speaks of, it speaks of conquest. As in the earlier description of the demonic locusts and the description of the, the beast in chapter 13. Um, horses in scripture are more often than not war horses. And ancients considered them to be terrifying with their size, their strength, and their, their stomping and their snorting. A horse with the head of a lion, that just, that just pushes the point. These are dem demonic beings that are set on conquering with destructive power. And the text in verse 18 and 19 describes fire, smoke, and brimstone coming out of their mouths. And then says their power is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are, are compared to biting serpents. So the attack from before and from behind. Again, we have to remind ourselves that John is doing his best to describe, uh, difficult to describe things that he's seeing in a vision. And this is clear in his use of that word like. Heads like lions, tails like serpents. Now this has led to a lot of speculation, as you could certainly expect, and perhaps you're speculating in your own minds right now, was John seeing modern military weaponry and trying to describe it to the best of his ability? Well, in the 80s and the 90s, I guess even before then, um, this was kind of a popular way of looking at John's description. But applying John's imagery in that way, well, it's interesting. It, to me, it seems rather forced. Um, if he were trying to describe tanks, why would he not use chariots to describe them? I mean, in that time, they had chariots that were large and that were like the tanks of their age. But instead, he chose horses. And while he had never seen anything like we have today, there were things much more tank-like that he could have used to describe. Oh, what if John is describing things that resemble horses with lion's heads and serpent tails with the ability to do harm from both ends? I mean, what if, what if he's seeing something that's some kind of genetic mutations? Secret military experiments gone wrong. At this point, a, a little over half of the world's population will have been killed. And we're talking billions of people. 
Um, I've already mentioned during our, our study of the seal judgments that I believe uh, nuclear and chemical weapons will be used in this day. I, I think that's a, a plausible way to so many uh, die in such a short amount of time. That and perhaps biological weapons. The Center for Disease Information uh, it estimates that the U.S. alone has an arsenal of over 35,000 nuclear weapons. Each bomb has the equivalent of 460 million tons of TNT. That's 35,000 times greater than the bomb that killed over 70,000 people at Hiroshima in 1945. Just 20 of Russia's 100 megaton bombs could destroy 75% of the population of the U.S. in less than an hour. Now, consider what we find in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The Greek word for elements there, uh, stoion, is defined as things that make up a thing. Peter uses the word in, in the context of 2 Peter 3.10 here to speak of the things that make up everything. And people, people then knew that larger things were made up of smaller things, but of course they didn't know about atoms. And Peter didn't know about atoms. And yet that is essentially what Peter's describing when he says the elements or the things which everything is composed of will melt with fervent heat. And the word for melt in, in Greek means to loosen something that is bound. So then it could be that by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter described in, in very accurate terms the untying of the atom and the, the fiery destruction that results. Now I mentioned biological weapons. What about those? You know, diseases have been weaponized, such as smallpox and Ebola, and of course anthrax, and then there are other gases and things like that, like sarin. These things were in the news a lot not that long ago. Potassium cyanide can kill in as little as 20 seconds. Only one teaspoon of botulinum could potentially kill 1.2 billion people. But whether nuclear or biological warfare or both, there still has to come a time when ground troops are sent in because that is the only way to ultimately take over a country. Now, we could spend all morning guessing, and it might be kind of fun to do that, but we'd really be missing the point. And that is that this is God's judgment. And whatever shape it ultimately takes, God has given us warning ahead of time just as he did in Noah's time. So will people repent? We'll find an answer to that in a moment, but first let's consider something. Where are these troops headed? Well, what's on the other side of the Euphrates River? Euphrates River is, is very likely one of the original boundaries of the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2 names four rivers which formed the boundary of the garden, the last of which named is the Euphrates. Now, of course, the Great Flood uh, altered all of the continents, even splitting them apart, certainly altering the course of rivers. But Eden is some, somewhat beside the point anyway. The Euphrates is also the eastern boundary of the land that God promised to Israel. Now, of course, it's not the border of Israel today, but it is the border of the land that God promised to Israel. So the army is headed toward Israel. Now before we move on, let's take a moment to remind ourselves of something. While what we've studied this morning, in fact all we've studied, is a part of God's judgment, it also demonstrates to us that God is in control. As big as all of these events seem, let's not forget how big God is. He's bigger, greater, He's sovereign. He's in control. He's the God who performed uh, the plagues on Egypt that delivered Israel from their bondage. He is the God who defeated vast armies and powerful nations on Israel's behalf during the travels through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And then God defeated more armies and nations once they entered the promised land. In fact, Second Chronicles 20 records God defeating a vast army of Moabites and Ammonites who had come up against Israel, and he did it without, any, without Israel even raising a weapon. 
He empowered the young man David to go out and kill Goliath and then put the whole Philistine army on, on the run. He is the God of Israel and the God of all who are identified with Jesus. And through the Lord, the way has been made for man to be saved. For all who call on the name of the Lord. So, now we find ourselves near to the end of chapter 9. And six of the trumpet, of the trumpet judgments have come. There's war, there's plague, there's famine, there's natural disasters. There's enormous death around the world. And the Antichrist, who we first saw with the loosing of the first seal, was supposed to have brought peace to the world. And yet, as the second seal revealed, he instead brought war. And as we saw in the third and the fourth seal, he also brought famine, more war, and even death by sickness and exposure. And so we find that by this time, the world that longed for peace that sought to attain peace by turning to this Antichrist, has anything but peace. And there can be no peace until the Prince of Peace rules. Verse 20 of chapter 9 tells us, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, that would be little less than half the population of the world at that time, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So earlier we pondered, will people repent? given all of these judgments and the consequences, everything that's going on at this time, will people not repent? What if they know without a doubt that all these things are the judgment of God, the wrath of the Lamb? They do. Chapter 6 closed with this. Everyone hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So yes, the the people of the world who are still living at this point know that they are in the day of wrath. And now we read that in spite of all these things, in spite of the dramatic judgment inflicted by this invading army, those who survive are still unrepentant. The resilience of the the hardened heart of a man is remarkable. You would think that these judgments would send anyone to their knees, and yet we see that they do not. And worse, their hearts may grow even more hardened against God. And even when things get worse, people will still then reject Christ. As further evidence, let's jump ahead. Let's look at what the text says about the pouring out of of bowl number 4 and 5. In Revelation 16, it says, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him the glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. Such is the hardness of the human heart even though faced by worldwide destruction and divine judgment from God. And looking back at verse 21 of our chapter, their worship of idols doesn't change, their murderous desires don't change, their immorality doesn't change. God is revealing himself to all the world in his power and in his might, and yet still there is no repentance. And let's not forget that there are Christian evangelists at this time who are sealed by God, living evidence of His grace. Yet still, the people under judgment will not choose Christ. But listen, 
You don't have to wait to see it in the tribulation. It's happening today. Most of us in here would remember Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, the devastation that it that wreaked on New Orleans. I've been there since, and you know what? New Orleans is worse now than it was before. What about areas in Asia where tsunamis have hit or places where huge earthquakes have struck? Go right back to worshiping their idols. Tremendous disasters have struck all over the world, and yet people have picked up right where they left off with no repentance. Anyone remember what it was like in, in churches in our own nation the weekend after September 11th? Church services were jam-packed. But a handful of months later, and it was back to normal. Go to church if it's convenient type of attendance. Some people are what you might call foxhole Christians. Whenever they're in trouble, they, they call out to Jesus. And because they're praying, they are convinced that they must be Christians. What's that? The old saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole. Spiritually, a person who only seeks God when they're in trouble is probably in trouble. <laughs> because they're probably, they probably convince themselves that they're saved when in fact they're not. Some people genuinely repent and are saved as a result of hard times and of tragedy, but then some people harden their hearts no matter what circumstances life throws at them. King David, he wrote in Psalm 119, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. In Luke 15, in the parable of the prodigal son, it says that when the prodigal son, when he hit rock bottom, or the text actually says, when he came to himself, that is, when he came to his senses, he returned and the Father welcomed him. Unfortunately, many people don't come to their senses. And here in our chapter, we see that it's as if in the tribulation, God has the people of the world in a mortar and he is grinding them like grain. But they will not repent, no matter how terrible the grinding gets. Proverbs 27 says, Though you grind a fool in a mortar with a pestle, along with crushed grain, yet his foolishness will not depart from him. It seems like an exercise in futility, and yet God continues to grind that more might repent and believe on Christ. As Peter told us in 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It would be better to confess Christ today than to put it off until tomorrow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank You for Your love. Lord, we thank You for Your grace. Lord, we thank You for Your mercy. Your name is Holy And Lord, we pray that your name would be holy to all the world, to all people, to all nations. We desire your kingdom. We seek to do your will. You've provided. And we know that you will continue to provide according to our needs, and we thank you for that. Lord, as you love each of us, as you have so loved each of us, Lord, teach us how to love one another. Lord, and as you have forgiven each one of us, teach us how to forgive and help us to forgive. Lord, help us to have our treasures in heaven rather than seeking after ourselves here on earth. And Lord, we ask that you would establish us in all good things, all your good things. We, we ask that you would guard our hearts, that you would keep our hands from evil, that you would protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. Lord, we thank you even as we go through trials because you graciously see us through. 
Lord, may you be glorified in our trials. And Lord, we thank you that you are our great high priest. We place ourselves before you to do your will. And we ask that you would lead us in victory. And that you would use us to spread the knowledge of Jesus Christ to the unsaved world. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said. Guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus. Thank you for listening. Remember to be a doer of the Bible and not just a hearer. That means demonstrating God's love to others as He has so abundantly poured out His love into your life. Most importantly, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision you could ever make. Choose your destiny. Don't let the world choose it for you. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and click on God to learn more about God's plan for your life. If you prayed to receive Jesus through this program, please let us know. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and select contact. While you're there, please consider sowing into this ministry by selecting donate. You have been listening to Grace Hope Love with Pastor Sean Bumpers and Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Thank you, my friend, for your fellowship, and may the Lord abundantly pour out His grace, hope, and love into your life.